I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on Open Studio, Rob Pro Black Gibbs, portrait of an artist. Why do I do what I do? It's because it feels right. Um, I feel like I have a responsibility because of uh, the gift I've been given to the, with the ability to create, translate, and kind of speak for a lot of folks other than myself. Then Sebastian Smee, observations from the Pulitzer Prize winning art critic. I think that we need art in some ways as uh, an expression of, of, of vitality, of life in, in, in the deepest sense. Plus, that time our shoot aboard a hot air balloon resulted in an emergency landing at rush hour. It's all now on Open Studio. Thanks for joining us. As Open Studio winds down its decade-long run, we continue my conversations with some of the most impactful figures working in the arts today. In this edition, we present the artist and the art critic. First up, I've watched over the years as Rob Pro Black Gibbs has authored this city as Boston's man of towering murals, part of the scaffolding that allows him to reach high, his unyielding optimism. Rob Pro Black Gibbs, thank you so much for being with us. What's going on, Jared? How you doing? I am well. I have always been struck by your positivity, and this is why I wanted you to be one of the final guests on the show, because it just makes me happy to be in your presence, to be honest. Um, it's an honor to be here, man. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, let Such me ask, I've been asking this question in this show, why do you do what you do? Why, why do I do... What I do, it's because it feels right. Um, I feel like I have a responsibility because of uh, the gift I've been given to the, with the ability to create, translate, and kind of speak for a lot of folks other than myself. And um, I get really excited about just knowing that the things that I'm doing is having an impact on who's to come. You have spent so much time with kids, too, as co-founding Artists for Humanity, the great organization which, which puts kids to work as artists. What I see in all of the young people that come through the program is just a piece of the future. AFA just opened so many doors for me. It's unbelievable. I'm still taking it, and I've been here for almost five years. It makes you feel like a sense of accomplishment, like you finished something. It's, like, empowering. You're a teacher. I wonder what you see coming up now in the next gen in a couple generations down of artists. The next generation is going to have all the um, the the how could I say it the the vocabulary I would say to like things that we just uncovered, and there's going to be practices that are going to be considered the norm. There's no more. You know, we wanted to change the term of a starving artist. Like if it's figuratively or in the, in the abstract, that's one way, but like we wanna make sure that there's, there's an industry that thrives off of just the energy and that the voices and the representation is, is just all inclusive. Making sure that they're like, you know, when you're telling your parents, I'm gonna grow up and be an artist, mm. it's, not a, it's not a thing to be scared of anymore. It's an actual career. When you told your parents that, was it hard for you to do that? I've never really told them that. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question, man. I think they've seen where I was going. And, like, the, the one thing that I had to do was earn their trust in a way that I didn't know that's what I was doing. I never really got any, like, pushback for the things I was doing. They were always supportive. I just felt like I couldn't go out in the world and misrepresent them and our family. When did you know you were an artist? I was late in the game. I had to have been like 14 or something like that. I knew I had the ability to look at things and like copy it real well, but I just thought it was something to, you know, pass the time. Because me and my cousins, we would finish our homework real fast. And then our grandfather was giving us like, you know, the, the newspaper, the funny section to kind of like do the cryptic quotes, the what's hits and things of that nature. And I started finishing those fast, looking at the like, you know, the comic strips from like Dagwood to uh, Peanuts, you know, um, Calvin and Hobbes, like any of those characters I was able to copy real well. So I just had that as like a, a, a secret <laughs> until a friend of mine saw what he was able to do, Damon Butler. And um, it really started with me just saying, you know what, I can do that too. <laughs> when you 
need art now? Where do you go? What do you do? What do you, is it reading, listening, going to museums? It's being around. I'm, I'm in like a collective of like very talented individuals. I work at Artists for Humanity where I get to see like I'm in a vehicle looking at the future. I've also come across like a lot of shows that I go to like First Fridays are a thing now. Before I never even thought about the first Friday of a month. Now we're going out to galleries, we're going to shows, I'm going to different cities. And so I'm tapping in on just like a lot of creatives in the communities that we all communicate with each other. And you got the luxury of just scrolling through your phone and, and, and tapping in with a lot of people who are connecting with you because of the work you're doing. So it's like um like many radio stations and we're broadcasting the stuff we're doing and people are picking up the frequencies and they're just throwing their work right back at you. So it's been a beautiful like spectrum that's just been opened up from being creative and touching a lot of people. So in terms of you in Boston, I have I've described to you as you're the man who authors our city. I mean, you really have you, with, with your great imagery and, and again, orienting people to mm -hmm. these beautiful pictures and notions and positivity. And then just before we sat down, you said you were starting to go to other cities, but you're not leaving, are you? Nah. You, you just promised me you're not leaving Boston. I just promised you, man, and I'm going to give you the, you know, the, the fingers crossed, secret handshake that I'm <laughs> never leaving. Um, to your point, like, it's, it's great to have the representation of the city wherever I go as well. So being an ambassador, being the, the, the face, giving a voice to just, you know, what a lot of people don't look at Boston as other than the sports teams, you know what I mean? Like, there's arts and culture here. There is a history here. There are people who've been born and raised, and we carry, you know, pretty much the same values that you would go somewhere else to try to visit. So I don't have this problem to go to other places and be like, you know what, this is cool, this is real tight. Come to the crib, you know what I mean? Come come home, and I, and I can show you, you know, what we're doing as well. So I think it's, 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 it's really amazing to have that, like, that scope and that reach to just be able to like go somewhere, make a little bit of noise, and then come back home. Because you know we got kids to raise. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I always say about New York now. I love to go to New York, and then I love to come home. As mm -hmm. much as I love that city and all it has to offer, I love to come home. I want to end by asking you about the positivity that has just so endeared me to you. We're in such tough times. We've been through a horrible few years. Uh, does your positivity ever get punctuated? Is it ever hard to carry? It's always been a challenge to balance or give people another thing to talk about or to look at. It's never really, um, I never look at something with a smile. I just know what could easily turn it around because it's infectious. As easy as it is to see somebody yawning and it's, it's, it's contagious. I was like, I'm hoping I can spread a smile the same way. There's a lot of hard things that we all sit back and talk about in private or just like amongst each other, but it's how we're represented when we're looking at things from a, a public side view, but we don't want people to feel bad for us or, or, or the hard times aren't the only times. You know, if anything, they don't even last. Tough people do. And we thrive through all of it. The resilience is what we celebrate or don't celebrate enough because it's, it's, there's always something hard. You think you got something going on, there's somebody that has it going on harder than you. And we could talk about that for days, but let those be the lessons and then let's celebrate the blessings and things that are coming to keep a lot of people looking forward to, you know what, okay, I see this challenge, it's gonna be a little bit of something. What did this individual do? There's, there's a level of inspiration that we can hold ourselves accountable for to spread that love, to spread the word, and to make sure that like we're leading by example and, 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 and living instead of surviving, you know? You need a mega church. <laughs> I <don't. laughs> Actually, I have one bonus question. I assume I'm looking at Bobby on your, your daughter. Oh yeah, you're looking at Bobby. Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever done an interview without the year, over the years without asking about her because I love your stories about her and how she appreciates art. She appreciates seeing herself in the, in the city. Mm -hmm. How's she doing? Bobby's doing amazing right now. Our rides in the car are just straight like interviews and <laughs> She's drilling me, asking me questions about why the sun and the moon are out at the same time. 
and her level of brilliance is is amazing. I'm learning everything I possibly can just from having conversations with her and, you know, bless her mother for teaching her, you know, just kind of how to learn. I'm just helping her apply it. So Bobby's just helping us be better people out here, and I'm going I'm to just kind of keep paving the way in this world so that she can um, benefit from it, you know? Well, Rob, this may be our last conversation here in this show, but one of many to come, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. Pleasure to be with you as well, Jared. And is there anything have you seen since um, we've met that's been different in the city from the time that you started paying attention to things to now? Like, is there anything that's really stuck out to you? I think the, the, the people who are now slowing down and paying attention to, to art, mm. I think that's what's stuck out. It's a, it's a different vibe and it's a different audience and it's a different appreciation now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Appreciate the work you're doing, Jared. Thank you. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs>
Yeah, it wasn't really a mentor relationship. You know, I, I was just a, a 29-year-old art critic who'd moved to London from Australia and uh, I got to know the painter Lucian Freud, who was 79 at the time. Um, and, you know, I, I ended up writing quite a few things about his work. Uh, but, yeah, he was, and a anyone who met him will testify to this, um, he was a pretty electrifying personality as well as, a, I think, a powerful artist. He painted the human body in ways that people can find uh, confronting or a little too truthful, perhaps. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think post-war American art is much more inclined to celebrate varieties of abstraction um, and he was very much not an abstract painter. I felt very lucky to get to know him and, and to have the chance to write about his work. Well, and what I wonder in that is that we all have our different learning experiences, but to get to know an artist, especially an artist who's so celebrated in a different way, perhaps a more intimate way, to, to actually get to know them and yeah. not see them at, at some kind of remove, how, how that, what, what kind of impact that may have had on you. You know, in an academic context, we're often taught to de-emphasize that connection between, uh, you know, the life and the work. Uh, but when you're standing in someone's studio right next to them and you can smell the oil paint and there's the canvas on the easel uh, and you're, 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 you know, you're hearing, you know, jokes and, and laughter and, and, and anxiety and concern and, and insecurity even, uh, you know, it's very powerful and you realise that art is intimately connected to life in so many ways. I think it transcends that. I think a lot of the artists I love most, you can feel that connection. It might just be a painter like Matisse or, uh, you know, someone just painting a, a, a bowl of fruit that, that, that you know was, you know, in their studio or, or on their table in their living room. Um, you know, there's all sorts of ways in which life and art are connected, but uh, when you feel that connection, I, I think it's really exciting. Well, finally, as a last question, for those of us who aren't artists, have you distilled why we, uh, it'll be the royal we, as a society, whomever, why we need art? I think that we need art in some ways as uh, an expression of, 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 of vitality, of life in, in, in the deepest sense. And also I think as a kind of antidote to some of the, the things about social life that are kind of deadening. And I think in our current moment of, of let's say, our, our obsession with metrics, I think that something about the, the immediacy, the here and now, uh, uh, the directness and honesty of art is, is, is a kind of great antidote to algorithms and artificial intelligence and all these things. And, uh, you know, that makes me think that we're going to need it more and more, actually, in, in the world that we're entering now, f for that sense of, uh, of connection with what it truly is to be human in, in the deepest way. Well, Sebastian Svee, again, it means a lot that you would come for one of our final shows. I think you're the greatest writer on art in America. Thank you. Jared, that's so kind of you. Thank you. And I'm so grateful. Thank you for inviting me on this terrific show. I always love it. Thank you. I want to take a moment now to thank a man who has been by my side, literally, for all of my career at GBH. Videographer Howard Powell has shot the majority of the stories you've seen here on Open Studio over the years. He's a friend, collaborator, and mentor. As he's heard me say on too many shoots, too many times, we're like the old married couple, married so long, we no longer realize we're fighting in front of the company. Although I am told that our bickering makes for an entertaining sideshow. But Howard and I came close to biting it a few years ago. In 2019, we covered New Horizon, a series of art events sponsored by the Trustees of Reservations. At its center was a huge, shiny, metallic hot air balloon which was floating across Massachusetts. We joined the balloon and its artistic team for what turned out to be a rather dramatic finale. Good morning, Lawrence Traffic, Hot Air Balloon 869, Uniform Sierra. Do you have me this morning? For this story, we'll begin at the end. On Monday, we'd been taking a pretty serene ride over Andover, floating above the treetops in a hot air balloon designed by artist Doug Aitken, a shimmering, inflatable sculpture he's titled New Horizon. I see New Horizon as really kind of a sculpture of time. It's something which is it's temporary, it's changing continuously. Um, when it stops, we can have these kind of incredible communal moments. But on this flight, we got communal fast. The wind picked up and we had to touch down. After two failed attempts, our pilot spotted a make-do landing strip. 
this small grassy median at the intersection of two busy routes at rush hour. Bend your knees. Hang on. Hang on. Right there, hold. Suddenly, New Horizon was on the ground, its silvery skin collapsing in a tired exhale. Cars stopped, the state police rushed in. Behind us, there's cars pulling over, diving in, helping, you know. I, I think it's just, it's, it's miraculous. We had an exhilarating landing. <laughs> Pedro Alonso is the guest curator of Art and the Landscape an effort by the trustees of reservations to disrupt the group's historic sites, not with art that's ornamental, but art that engages. Yeppe Hines mirrored Labyrinth at World's End in Hingham, Sam Durant's Meeting House at the Old Manse in Concord, and Alicia Quade's Exploration of Reality at the Crane Estate in Ipswich. I'm convinced that the public wants art. They just don't want to feel intimidated. Or, or uninformed when they look at it. And this is the kind of artwork that people will be surprised. That was art. Alonzo also takes a devilish glee in the element of surprise. Remember the photograph that mysteriously appeared on Boston's former Hancock Tower one day? That was Alonzo teaming with French artist J.R. They did it again two years ago, installing an image of a child peering over a Mexican border wall into the U.S. That kind of surprise? is, for me, much more valuable than a programmed event. But what does it do to, 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 to plunk a sculpture down in the middle of rush hour traffic, literally in the middle of rush hour traffic? Oh, it, it's, it's, well, first, people take notice. <laughs> you know, people definitely take notice. And, and I think it, it's the kind of thing that just changes your day. You're going to think very differently about how your day went. In a world where everything is so homogenized and so repetitious, you know, we need disruption. We, we, we need moments of kind of our, our, a crack in our daily reality. Hundreds of feet up in the air before our sudden landing, artist Doug Aiken says when Alonzo commissioned him to create a piece for art and the landscape, he knew zero about hot air balloons. So he used the idea of the classic American road trip as a point of departure. It's kind of baked into our DNA, this idea of the other, this idea of disappearance or kind of moving into the landscape, a landscape that we don't know. You know, I think there's an aspect of this project that's intensely physical. I couldn't have said it better than that sound. <laughs> the California-based artist and filmmaker is a big thinker and creator. He's animated an entire Manhattan block with his piece Sleepwalkers. He curated Station to Station, a train that doubled as a light sculpture as it crossed the U.S. And in underwater pavilions, he submerged giant sculptures off the California coast. The idea of community, the idea of these kind of flashpoints across the landscape has been very provocative. New Horizon has been popping up, and in our case, floating across Massachusetts for the last two weeks, moving from Martha's Vineyard to the Berkshires. In daylight, it's a 100-foot tall beacon. At night, it's a floating light show. And wherever the balloon goes, people gather for music, speakers, and conversation in organized happenings. They see this object and they, you know, and they track it down and suddenly they're there and, you know, it's almost like a kind of hallucination. It's what we saw too. People coming out of their homes, taking a break from work. It's from up here that we saw how different our community looks. In the lushness of summertime, Massachusetts presents as a veritable rainforest. Those moments, you know, when you have a kind of awakening, when you really kind of see the mundane and it becomes vital and fresh and real again. And New Horizon reminds us that a lot of life, nature, fate, it's all out of our control. Minutes before our adventuresome landing, Aiken told me he even planned for the unplannable. It's a very rogue project. In the end, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of about improvisation. It's about the sense of openness. And we don't really know what's going to happen tonight or tomorrow. And I kind of love that. Especially when a grounded hot air balloon makes you appreciate an otherwise benign traffic median on a whole new level. And that is all for this edition of Open Studio. Next week, we look back at time well spent with local artists, including the sculptors at Madhouse Motors. 
And join us on June 2nd as two very special guests sit down with me for the final episode of Open Studio. Grammy winner Lori McKenna and Tony winner Alan Cumming. To get in the mood for our series finale, we bring you a performance from 2016 when Lori McKenna, fresh off a Grammy win, joined us on Open Studio. She performed her song, People Get Old, based, she told us, on her father and her husband's father. Someone said youth is wasted on the young I spilled every last drop of time that summer in the sun Tumex watch, cigarette in his hand, and a mouthful of scotch. Spinning me around like a tilt a whirl on his arm. Well, house is neat, paint, winters bring snow. Your kids come on in before your supper gets cold. Collect your plates, and daddy's bill fold, and that's how it goes. You live long enough, people get old. Set up brow beside him in the cab of that truck Going 30 miles an hour down a side road Talking about the fish we caught And I'm older now than he was then If I could go back in time, I would in a second To his beat up blue jeans and a t-shirt with the sleeves cut off Houses need paint, winters bring snow Kids growing up and sneaking out the window Hitting every small town dirt road And that's how it goes 